um, you find the kid, you romance the family. You know, you're talking about high school kids on, on this level. And you spend a couple of years watching this kid develop, uh, getting to know the parents, getting to know what their expectations are, if they're realistic or not, and what the kid's goals are, because maybe this is a prospect who really should be going to college before he tries to be a professional ball player. Right. Um, maybe, these, maybe these parents have outsized expectations of what this boy can really draw in the market. So you're really kind so, of romancing the parents as much or more than the kid because mostly they're underage, right? Yes. When oh, this yes. is going on. Oh, yes. I found that really interesting because yeah. I tended to think it was going to be much more the player in the, and the scout. But it really is about the scout, as you say, and the, and the, the whole complex of the family. Right, right. Yes. And um, so you all have to kind of be on the same page, as it were. And uh, then there's competition. It's not just you in the world. There's other teams who have also scouted this, this boy and may be making competing offers. And where does this, if the boy has a lot of offers, he, then he's in a better and better position to ask more and more money. And then factors come into play. Well, where does he want to play? You know, I was in a scouting meeting where the, the Dodgers really wanted this one kid who I think was from Seattle. The father didn't want him to play in Los Angeles because he didn't want him to, quote, play in the smog. They couldn't get him no matter what they did. Sure. The father had a, a preconception. So it's you're being a salesman. On one hand, you're selling your team. And that actually is part of being a scout. They have you know brochures and folders, and they show them this is the training field. This is where you'll live, mom. Sure. Don't worry about it. He's going to be in you know, in this dorm and this place. And so, it's much more complex than just looking at the boys' tools. You know. Oh, it really is. There's a certain messianic quality, or maybe I should say missionary. Reminded me a little <laughs> bit, you know. Of, I mean, truly, you know, you have to sell, as you say, um, the entire, you know, the entire organization. package. And mm -hmm. I was thinking when you were just talking about that that it's not that different than you and your auction for North of Montana, is it? Yeah. The sign. Oh well, no, seriously. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of parallels in what you said earlier about the sign uh -huh. for your book and the kind of thing that goes on when you do have. Um, are there preemptive sign sorts of packages too? Just the, Probably, like the one you were yes, talking about. Yes, I'm sure there are. And I'm talking about boys without agents. This is all. This right. is all the lower, not lower, first level before they really get agents. When you have agents into it, it's a whole different, you know, no scene. Kidding. So um, Cassidy's in a lot of trouble in the beginning of the book because she had two promising players and she couldn't make the sign. She couldn't get them into the organization. Um, and obviously for scouts, the more people they get signed and into the farm system, the better their own status is. Sure. You want to have a good percentage of that. Remind me, does she get paid just for her time, or does she get paid? Is it is it really on delivery? No, it's a salary. It is a salary. Yeah. It's not a, a salary plus commission or some sort no. of thing. Huh? No. But that's a big expense then for the team. I mean, if she spends devotes a year or two to courting this kid and you know traveling around and everything, and then it all goes pear shaped. Absolutely. Oh, uh, then <laughs> you know. So there's. There's, I think some of us wonder sometimes here in Phoenix, at least, um, why are we paying these outrageous prices well. for tickets, et cetera, et cetera, and and it's just because there is so much money behind, you know, the scenes as well as the stadium and on and on. We have a local author, Jenny Hartsmark, who writes uh, a lawyer character, and each time because she's a white-collar corporate lawyer, her lawyer does a different business. She's done pharmaceutical oh. companies, all sorts of stuff, but she did a football book because she was interested in the business of professional sports and so she created a NFL team in Milwaukee and went through some of the same things that you're talking about, um, you know, a stadium and, and all of that and I found it was, you know, it was absolutely fascinating to, um, to see that. Well, are you planning um, another book for Cassidy? I, you said you're going back to Anna Gray, but um, is Cassidy somebody you think your story pretty much wrapped up and be the one? You know, I don't know the answer to that. I didn't plan on that, although people keep asking me that. I think she is a terrific character. I'd like, I'd like to see more of her. Yeah. Um, but it's complete as it is, too. It's complete as it is. It, it is. Um, you know, people ha carry expectations with them, and I think in the crime world, you expect to see your main character go on and on. Um, but, um, which can be a good thing or a bad thing, but let me see where, sh where she is in about a year in my mind. 
I like standalone books. I mean, I, yeah. I wasn't asking you that because I had an agenda. Um, yeah, no, I, well, I kind of like, you know, I've always thought Gone with the Wind when it was over. I didn't want to go back to Tara. Well, yeah. You know, when Rebecca ended and Manderly Burns, as far as that's I was that, concerned, it was over. <laughs> you know, that's one of my favorite books of all Me too, time. but the house was the character, you yes. know. Once it went up in flames, who really cared about what happened to Maxim and Mrs. DeWinter? I read the, <laughs> you know, the whatever it was, um, follow-up book that somebody published a year ago, and I hated it. Oh, I think that's a crime other people writing sequels to other people's work. Right. I just think that's that's illegal in some moralistic way. Well, not only that, but I think that part of the book, some of the punch, at least with Gone with the Wind, and those, I mean, those two books just happen to be on my mind for some reason, part of the punch is not knowing. Mm -hmm. It's that ambiguity you're left with, so that mm -hmm. you, the reader, get to paint in whatever ending you feel like, you know, and you can decide either, you know, Rhett and Scarlet are going to make it, or, you know, yes. it was over, or whatever, and, and I don't really want somebody to tell me. I agree. So, you know, Cassidy, you know, we know where she is at the end of the book and what's going on, and that's the way. I thought Anna actually had another story in her, which I guess yes. is a distinction for me. I wasn't quite sure that, you know, that we were done with her, and I, that's maybe why I expected to be the one to be the Anna, be but the I'm the thrilled Anna. you're going to do another one. Thank you. Um, this has really been a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Well. And thank you for coming. And as always, our hour just goes, yeah, what happened? And here we are. <laughs> but I've really learned a lot. And I have so much enjoyed the books. And congratulations on your recent brilliant review in the Daily New York Times. Yeah, thank you. And you certainly have had some other outstanding ones. I hope you'll come back and see us again. Oh, I will. Thank you, April. Thanks, And Barbara. I certainly thank all of you for joining us on another episode of The Criminal Calendar. Mm -hmm.